when we were coming up with the presentation, uh, we were struggling with who is our audience. And uh, we had widely different opinions about uh, the familiarity of, cloud, of people with CloudStack. So I'd like to know uh, who's used CloudStack before. OK, that's about roughly uh, 30 40%. Who's um, developed on CloudStack before? Wow. OK. And uh, who's familiar with other cloud platforms like Eucalyptus or OpenStack? OK. So and then who's used uh, things like Amazon Cloud? Deployed. Oh wow, that that's excellent. Thanks. Um, so uh, as I said, you know the presentation may not be, you know, fitting your needs, and so please tell us if uh, if you need more explanations or if you want me to go in a different direction. I know that uh, it's being taped, and he has my presentation, but I'm sure we can go off course. This is the clicker. Um, I'm going to go over uh, like what is CloudStack, what kind of problems does it try to solve. Um, I'll go over some of the features, which, given that about 30% of you have actually used CloudStack, it might be new to you. Um, I'll talk about uh, the system architecture. Uh, and give you some kind of context about you know what are the various parts of the system architecture, and then Alex will take over and you know go a little more in depth, in depth about the actual architecture of the uh, of the product. Uh, any questions so far? Um, so what is CloudStack? So when we developed uh, CloudStack, like we started in uh, the end of uh, 2008, and it was always a uh, decision or a, a view that if uh, something like Amazon can be so successful, uh, why not um, other providers, why not other uh, enterprises, why can't they be so successful uh, in deploying and, and building clouds? And so we set out to build a, a turnkey platform for delivering um, IAS clouds, um, and then you know somebody like Amazon has the luxury of sticking to a single hypervisor. But uh, typically, uh, you guys are interested in you know deploying on different hypervisors. So uh, being hypervisor agnostic was uh, was one of our uh, goals. Um, scale, of course, just like uh, what Amazon, Rackspace, etc. do. Uh, secure because if you're deploying on a public cloud. Uh, if you're not secure, nobody's going to deploy on you. And uh, although initially CloudStack was not open, uh, I think in the middle of 2010, uh, we open sourced most of it. And then uh, when Citrix acquired cloud.com, we open sourced everything. So it was all GPL. We developed in the open. And as you guys know that uh, in the beginning of April, uh, we donated the code base to Apache. And we're incubating in the Apache. Um, and then some of our um, customers also uh, host uh, CloudStack for other people. And so uh, that's another use case uh, which CloudStack solves. And then, of course, cheaper and faster is always uh, the goal for any product. Um, so some of the uh, uh, places where uh, CloudStack is deployed. We have uh, on-premise uh, dedicated clouds uh, where it's behind the firewall and it's total control of the enterprise. So the security and total control of the uh, from the enterprise perspective. Uh, we also have uh, hosted enterprise clouds where uh, there's the service provider installs physical resources for the customer and then uh, manages the cloud for the customer. And uh, we have multi-tenant public clouds, which is our uh, 
for, by far the greatest success cloud stack has had just because that's the emerging market uh, or the market that has emerged first is uh, is is an amazon style uh, public cloud where there's multiple tenants isolated by you know various technologies uh, and they can get you know elastic resources from the cloud um, any questions so far Uh, one of the nice things about uh, a cloud stack is that we have a, a fantastic UI, and I'm not sure if uh, our UI designers are here today, but uh, we pay a great we paid a great deal of attention to uh, the look and feel of the UI uh, to make it a very usable UI, and that's not just for the end user, uh, but also for the admin, and so uh, both the end user UI and the admin UI. Are you know backed by or they use the uh, end user API or the admin API to uh, interact with CloudStack, and then we also have a bunch of third-party clients like Fog or Knife or um, uh, or we have a built-in Python client which you can use to interact with CloudStack. Um, Wrong button, sorry. Um, so, as, as what an IAS cloud does is that it, 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 it orchestrates physical resources in order to provide virtual uh, computing resources to you. And the physical resources include uh, compute like hypervisors, Zen Server, VMware, Oracle, VM, KVM. And bare metal is, is what is supported today, and uh, and storage. And so you can uh, run your VMs on local disk, on SAN or NFS, or uh, or you can even um, uh, you know store Im template images on something like Swift and then uh, boot from there. And uh, we also control networks, and that's by far uh, like the, the biggest flexibility in, which comes with CloudStack is that you can control many different kinds of hyper, uh, network devices and provide uh, services from layer 2 to layer 7 um, to the end user. Uh, any questions so far? Um, so as I said, uh, the problem definition was, uh, you know, a scalable, flexible, manageable IS platform, and and the following established cloud computing paradigms was important because you know we had a good example which is Amazon, and so an Amazon style cloud is uh, what CloudStack tries to emulate. Uh, what IIS does, of course, is it orchestrates physical and virtual uh, resources uh, to offer self-service. Uh, infrastructure and pro provisioning and monitoring at large scale, and, and some something which uh, which Citrix talks about is when you traditional virt virtualization you have you know one admin trying to manage ten servers or twenty servers. Uh, when you move to uh, something like an IAS cloud, you have one admin handling thousands of hosts. So it's it's the it's the difference in scale, a difference in price points, and difference in uh, in, in ease of use. In automation, and the scalability we're talking about is, you know, when when people download CloudStack and use it, they have just typically one host or two hosts to play with, and so the intention is that it should be easy enough for them to run a two-host cloud. And I remember in uh, when we started, and we were looking at other IaaS platforms, and we would wonder why people would download, let's say, uh, something like. I think there was a eucalyptus and a couple of others at that time, and run a, a cloud on two hosts. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. Now it does because uh, I know a lot of you guys just want to try it out first. And so it's important that you know it, it works from either one hypervisor or tens of thousands of hypervisors, and it's the same ease of use. It's no extra. I mean, there's a few configuration tweaks to make, but it should be the, just the same experience. 
and, and likewise, if you're a, if you're an end user uh, and you're using a public cloud, you want you know it, your public cloud to support you know thousands and thousands of users. Um, and because it's you know it's software designed to be flexible, so we want to be able to handle new resources. I think uh, over the years we have had added re uh, support for Oracle. Uh, I mean, we started with Zen Server, open source Zen. Then we have, um, then we added support for commercial Zen or Zen Server. And then we added support for VMware, KVM, and Oracle VM. So at the, at the same time, there's not been any much change to the kernel. The kernel of the of cloud stack doesn't really care about what's underneath because there's just drivers to be added there. And as we have added more network uh, APIs, more storage APIs, uh, you know, we've gone beyond the original Amazon set of APIs. We've been able to add those uh, APIs very easily. And then uh, as end users or admins of, of clouds, you guys want additional services. And so we've been able to add those uh, easily as well. Um, and a very important goal for CloudStack is to be manageable and so to I mean, when, when you're using the Amazon Cloud or Rackspace Cloud, you really don't know what's underneath, what hypervisor is there, what are you using a, um, a Intel CPU or AMD CPU, right? Um, so the, uh, hiding that complexity of the underlying resources is, is, is a goal. And so the, the UI fills a, a large part of that usability goal. Um, and then an admin API, which, you know, uh, which other clients can use to drive automation in the cloud is also a very important goal and a big part of cloud stack. And so you'll no, never find the UI talking to the uh, to cloud stack through you know uh, secret channels, always through the admin API. Um, so easy install upgrade, of course, um, and simple scaling. So it should be as easy as you know adding more. Uh, memory or adding more uh, CPU cores to to scale this um, uh, to, to scale cloud stack and um, an automated resilience is that if the underlying physical resource is not behaving the way you want it to behave or well, what does cloud stack do right and then, and then and then you know resilience is is one goal of cloud stack and as I was saying before you know EC2 inspired it is uh, a large part of our API set and a large part of the semantics of CloudStack is driven by uh, what Amazon established. But at the same time, we have had experience with 100 different customers who asked their own uh, changes and also the open source community, of course. Um, and so it's there are semantic variations and there are some things which you just cannot do if you don't own the infrastructure. So there will be uh, semantic variations. Any questions so far before I just go through the uh, more general overview of CloudStack and how it works? Hybrid clouds, anybody? Sorry. Sure. All over hybrid. Yeah. Um, So do you have many customers already using this in a hybrid scenario? And are the APIs, the management APIs, exposed to the downstream end user customers so that they can manage deployments in both on-premise and off-premise cloud? Are you talking about the admin API specifically? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not familiar yeah. with that. But yeah, sure. Can you give him the mic, please? Oh, he has one right It's not on, I think. Hello? Hey, guys. Uh, so Disney has actually done some work in this area using Chef and Knife, um, and also uh, some custom gems we wrote for Puppet uh, against uh, InterNAP, uh, E, was it Rackspace, and then uh, AWS uh, and Amazon. And then we're just using uh, if-else statements or a specific gem call 
in order to automate the uh, implementation. Uh, but it's all physical hardware. So we're not actually building VMs out in the public clouds. What we're doing is we're building physical <clears throat> servers, extending our hypervisors, adding into our uh, management server, and then managing it as a bursted uh, environment. And then uh, when we're done, we wipe the drives, and then we, uh, we collapse it out of the, the public cloud. So right now, we're not putting anything out there. We found a number of things that are preventing us from bursting in a hybrid cloud, particularly uh, load balancers, uh, GTM across uh, multiple spaces without DNS round robin. Uh, makes it very difficult to burst on demand. It takes a lot of effort to get it done. Uh, additionally, uh, firewalls, uh, managing IP tables out in the public cloud versus managing traditional ACLs on a firewall. I'm trying to find work with vendors like Cisco, uh, what is it, Nasira, and a couple others to, to get a common API that firewalls are now consistent across the environment itself. Um, and a, a couple other nuances, but we're still working it out, and we, I think we've talked to uh, Shang and, and a number of his team, and even vendors themselves to kind of push him in this direction of meeting the traditional private infrastructure along with the public cloud first based uh, scenario. Uh, that sounds very exciting, thanks. Um, uh, could, could you introduce yourself, sorry? Oh, uh, uh, Pete Lopez, uh, architect at the Walt Disney Company. And, and Pete just mentioned uh, Shang. I don't know if you guys have met Shang. Uh, Sheng was a uh, mover and shaker behind uh, cloud.com, and uh, he's here today, too. So. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so, Pete, just to follow up on that, what, what was the key to, uh, to bursting? Is it just the, the fact that the APIs are so uh, usable or... Well, we, we actually started everything on the EC2 APIs, um, but we found that it's not completely covered in the EC2 implementation in CloudStack. Um, so what we did is we actually uh, threw a variable for determining which place we're going. The preference would be to use EC2 as a common API base and then to expand out in, in a way that's consistent so we wouldn't care which cloud it's at. As long as you're using EC2 calls, you can either do private cloud or, or public cloud. Um, but the, the, real, the real work actually came into the actual API calls themselves and to make it actually a consistent interface. Great, thanks. Um, so th what I'm going to go through next is uh, could be a little bit uh, old hat for the, those, those of you who have already used CloudStack, uh, so bear with me. Um, so if you're an end user, uh, and if you use an Amazon Cloud, this should be uh, fairly familiar to you. Uh, there's a, a launch wizard, which wants you, if you want to deploy a VM, uh, you pick a service offering. Um, so you, you first pick a template, what Amazon or anybody else calls an image, we call a template. Um, you could pick the operating system. Um, you pick a service offering, small, large, medium, and one small. Uh, these offerings can be customized by the admin through the admin API, of course. Um, and then uh, a lot of CloudStack users like to offer fixed size of uh, volume disks. So uh, you can also customize this as the admin, whether you want to offer uh, small disks or large disks. Um, I believe you can also offer an unlimited uh, disk as well. Um, and then uh, you can choose which network you want to deploy on. And, uh, or you can add a new network. So each tenant can own multiple networks, somewhat like an Amazon VPC, and, uh, and, and deploy um, the VM on that network or on multiple networks. So for example, if you checked um, customer net and and VLAN 100, then your VM would end line up on, would have two NICs, one on customer net and one on VLAN 100. And then, boom, you create the VM. And then you get this nice uh, little dashboard which shows you uh, what's running and what's stopped, etc. cetera. Um, and then just all your virtual resources, which are instances, uh, storage network, uh, any templates that are visible to you and the, those yet that you have uploaded events. Uh, for example, you just created an event. And then we have a feature called projects, which uh, you can use to collaborate with different users. 
Um, so if you're a user, you can you know do regular BM operations, start, stop, restart, destroy, fairly standard for an IS cloud. You get an I, uh, console access through a uh, Ajax console, which is you don't need to install anything; it displays right on the browser. Um, you get uh, statistics about the VM, how much CPU is utilized, networks, uh, read and writes. Um, no disk I/O yet. And then uh, you can always shut down your VM, change the service offering. I want a uh, I'm on two CPUs now, I want four CPUs, and boom, you're up and going. Um, as an end user, you can manage volumes, um, add whatever volumes you want to, uh, to your VM. You can add a new volume, detach volumes, and move them around, just like any other, just like Amazon. Um, create a template from the volume, so Let's say you started with, uh, what you can do is you can uh, start with an ISO, you can boot from an ISO in Cloud Stack, and then you provision your, uh, you, you install the VM into, an, into a volume, install all the, let's say you're creating a MySQL uh, template. You boot from, let's say the Red Hat CD, you install Red Hat on a volume, you install MySQL on it, um, customize it the, the way you want, you're happy with it, and now you can create a template from that volume. And then uh, the next time you can just use that template to create a MySQL server. Um, you can snapshot, uh, there's a snapshot API and a snapshot on demand, or you can create a schedule, you know, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. Um, and then you can see, well, what snapshots you have and then delete them selectively. Um, as far as networks go, you can uh, create networks. As I said, you can create any number of networks and attach VMs to uh, multiple of them, so a multiple NIC uh, is supported. Um, typically, you're working in a, uh, if you're working in a public cloud, you have your private addresses for the, uh, for the VM themselves, and then you have public addresses. And then we allow you to acquire uh, multiple public IP addresses and then use uh, port forwarding, NAT, firewall, in order to give uh, provide services to the uh, to the rest of the internet from your VM. Um, and then, if you're using like the Amazon style security, you can do uh, ingress and egress firewall rules, security groups, uh, and then you can start up uh, load balancers to uh, load balance between uh, VMs. And this is all orchestrated by Cloud Stack, of course. Uh, what you see here is um, the list of IPs uh, you have, all these are in the San Jose zone. Um, actually, this is an admin view. Right? Yeah, it's an admin view. Um, obviously, this the admin is seeing everybody's uh, VMs or uh, IP addresses there. Um, let me just pause here and ask about any uh, questions about features. This is 3.0, yeah. Are people uh, still using 2.2? A lot of them? Okay. Um, so uh, just like you know, um, AWS, uh, Amazon uh, Web Services, uh, we support uh, multiple availability zones. Not sure why that clicked so fast. Okay. Um, and then within a zone, uh, we assume the, the following physical resources. You have your hosts, which are uh, hypervisors, and hi and the hosts are managed as clusters because that's what the underlying hypervisor manager expects. For example, a VMware or a vSphere cluster, a Zen server cluster, or even if it's KVM, we just automatically cluster them. Um, and then all these hosts share a primary storage so that you can uh, migrate between uh, hosts. So if you use the admin API, you can put 
let's say host one into maintenance and then uh, the VMs that are on host one get uh, live migrated to host two automatically. Um, and, then with, and then all these clusters are organized inside a pod and typically there's a, like an access layer or like at the top of the rack switch which connects to the L3 core of the data center and then you just repeat that pods so that uh, you get this uh, uniform view of the data center. And then uh, the management server, you know, managing it through the outside, you can manage it from outside the firewall. It doesn't have to be inside the data center. And then uh, the, the inter you get access to the internet through the L3 core. You also see uh, secondary storage there. And so that's just uh, typically an NFS server, uh, fairly easy to get up and running. And that stores your uh, images, templates, snapshots, and, uh, and ISOs. And uh, that secondary storage can be something like Swift or you know, maybe in the future something with an S3 API. Oh, question. Uh, just had a question on the live migrate. Uh, my name is Jayesh. Uh, so are you using a, a native technology for live migrate or is there a, a generic technology that's there for live migrate? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. So um, when CloudStack talks to the hypervisor, it always talks native APIs. <coughs> There's no... Um, if it's VMware, we use the vCenter API. If it's Zenso, we use uh, Zappy. And if it's uh, KVM, we use the uh, Libvirt as the uh, native API. So it's always the native API. We don't try to out, you know, second guess the, uh, the, the hypervisor manager. Hello? Yeah. Hi, I have a question. Uh, in this uh, diagram, there's uh, four tiers. Uh, I'm interested in the cluster cluster tier. Uh, what is the mainly design uh, benefit uh, to have this tier? Yeah, so as I said, we talk, we rely on the hypervisor manager, like a vCenter or the, uh, Zen, or the uh, Zen server pool to provide us a lot of the services, right? So we don't try and go directly to the uh, host API. We, we talked to the, the, the hypervisor manager. And so the, if, if you want to live migrate VMs between hosts, then we have to, they have to be in a cluster. That's what the hypervi hypervisor manager says you have to do. Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, okay. And so, and the hypervisor manager says that you, you need to have some prime share storage between these guys so that you can migrate the VMs. Because it's interesting that, you know, oh, go ahead. Hey, Jadip, a uh, question on um, where would any uh, firewalls and all of those things be connected in this, um, in the architecture? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the question is where, where would we connect uh, firewalls? So typically, and I'll come into uh, networking later on, um, we support many different modes of networking, but the most popular is we use VLANs to isolate. And so as long as the, the firewall and the load balancer has one interface on the uh, internet side and one interface where they can uh, access that VLAN, so you can deploy them anywhere. But typically, yeah, right around there, hanging off the L3 core. Sure. And one more question is, is that these hosts, um, do they refer to physical devices or are they like virtual machines when you got... Oh, these are hypervisor hosts. Sure. Hello? Yeah. Uh, you have a LC core uh, is it uh, is it ordinary router? Is it correct? Cisco router, for example. Uh, the access layer. Uh, sorry, L three core. L three core. Yeah, it's typically yes. Any of the Cisco, Juniper, whatever mm -hmm. you want. Yeah. And Dell, for is, is it under control of CloudStack? No. No. Okay. But 
not today, but there's no reason you can't. You can write a plugin which controls it. Uh, I'll come into the uh, the networking later, but today, for instance, um, if you have a VM running here and a VM running in this pod, uh, so let's say a tenant has a VM in in this host and a ten and a and a VM in this host, um, then he has a, a common VLAN which stretches across the L3 core. Um, so that has challenges because you need to provision every VLAN on every um, a link there. And so if we wrote a plugin which controlled the L3 core, then you could selectively enable VLANs on different links. Sure. Um, I can probably help you with that. We actually trunk 300 VLANs down into every server in a consistent manner using bonded network interfaces and then a dedicated management interface on the native VLAN. And then what we did is we provisioned that directly against the actual tenants themselves as individuals, spanning above layer three at layer two, um, outside of the actual virtualized infrastructure into the physical. So by trunking all of your VLANs in, you're able to selectively activate whichever one you want across all the clusters in the zone. There was a question. Um, the availability, the zone, is it more like the availability of zones in, uh, in Amazon where it's geographically some, uh, how should I say it? It's geographic, or is it more more of a per customer kind of like in a multi tenant? Uh, we we support both. Um, so the original idea is that this is a multi tenant infrastructure. So you could have multiple tenant VMs here, um, and then you could have multiple availability zones and use the same cloud stack management server to manage multiple of them. And so the idea is that if this zone fails, customers have a choice in deploying VMs elsewhere. Uh, but there is also the concept of private zones. So if, uh, if you're a managed service provider and you have lots of hardware, and a customer says, and I want to make sure that only my <coughs> VMs run on, on any set of hardware, that I'm not actually a multi-tenant, then the, the service provider can set up a private zone. So this is what it's showing here that um, you can have multiple availability zones, and there's nothing saying that you know one zone is within one data center. So if if uh, if this data center has you know multiple redundant power supplies, and then if you're fairly confident that zone three is not going to fail at the same time as zone two, uh, then you can deploy them in the same uh, data center. But the entire thing is managed by um, a single management server cluster. And so that's showing here that, you know, the management server is in one zone, but uh, because uh, there's, we assume there's like high-speed links between uh, data centers, it can manage all the zones. And, uh, you know, you, you can deploy multiple management servers for scale and reliability. They automatically cluster as you start more of them. And uh, typically, a uh, single management server can manage up to 5,000 hosts. So, um, I I'm sure we can tune it to be better if needed, but seems like a good goal to have. Um, and so, if you have like a single management server, it, it talks to a MySQL database. Um, you typically uh, put it behind a firewall uh, so that admin and user APIs can access it. Uh, if you do a multiple management server cluster, you put a load balancer in front of it, so you get an automatic sharding of uh, user requests, and um, and then each of them, the the management servers talk to each other, automatically shard the uh, the physical resources underneath. They pick, you know, if there's three of them, they pick one third of the hosts for themselves to uh, manage, and then they manage the host. Um, and then you really want to do like uh, slave replication just to make sure that your database is reliable. Uh, the management server, I think, uh, uh, you usually QA on uh, RHEL uh, and Ubuntu, uh, no, RHEL. Well, 5.4, 4, 
but uh, we have a community using it on Ubuntu and Fedora as well. Uh, any questions so far about the deployment of the management source? Uh, so we had a discussion earlier about uh, primary storage. So the primary storage is uh, shared storage for a cluster so that uh, primarily so that you can boot quickly um, and then you can also do uh, snapshots and, and, and migrate uh, VMs between hosts. Um, and then we allow you to specify a uh, storage network so that the hypervisors have you know, speedy access to the uh, storage server. Um, and then depending on the hypervisor, um, there's various technology supported, you know, if typically all hypervisors support iSCSI, Fiber Channel, and NAS. Um, and then there's not, you don't have to uh, limit it to one, you can have multiple volumes, um, sorry, multiple uh, primary storages. And then you can also tag these, let's say you have three primary storages, uh, one of them is SSDs, one of them is uh, 10K drives, and one of them is regular 72 RPM drives. Uh, you, so then you can tier the storage, and then uh, we saw the disk offerings earlier on, and then when the, when the user wants to create a uh, VM, he can say, you know, I want the SSD offering, and then uh, we'll go off and create it on the SSD uh, primary storage. And of course, you as a provider or a you can charge more for that. Sure. So uh, I had a question uh, kind of going back to the hypervisor. Yeah. <clears throat> um, CloudStack 3.01 came out uh, and Zen Server uh, 6.02 is out, but the Zen pack uh, doesn't match up and so you're still using Zen Server 6.0 and with limited support for 6.02, which has a number of bug fixes. Is there a roadmap where these releases are, are going to be in line so that when the updated version of Zen Server and security packs come out, we're, we're not behind uh, from a security perspective? Um, let me see if somebody else can answer this. Um, yeah, that is the goal. Um, uh, as it happens today, that uh, they, uh, the Zen Server team has a, a separate release schedule, and the Cloud Check has a separate release schedule. Uh, but uh, we are moving some of our test cases into uh, Zen Server automated test cases um, so that uh, they cannot release without uh, CloudStack also working on the latest release. Uh, but I, I don't know when that's actually going to happen, so well, that's the goal. Um, sure. Hello. Uh, can I confirm that uh, uh, rest restriction uh, restriction of that zone? When when we use two zones and uh, they have uh, they have each each secondary storage uh, is it correct? And if we if we try to access the secondary storage in another zone, is it prohibited? Is it correct? Um, because, the way you access uh, the way you access secondary storage is typically you're trying to get access to your snapshots or your templates. Mm -hmm. um, so we do provide a way to copy mm -hmm. your templates. From one zone to another. Zone to, uh -huh. Okay, and yeah. thank you. Of course, everything is metered, and so you can bill for these usages. Um, yeah, so secondary storage, you know, is zone level. Today, it's zone level. Uh, I think a lot of people would like it to be at at a more at a management server level, so that it's shared as uh, as you were asking. Um, Uh, so today, the main uh, main use case today is NFS, 
So you, you configure one or more NFS servers, um, and then uh, use that for uh, storing snapshots and templates. Um, so just a reiteration, host, storage, cluster, pod. Um, a network is uh, end user network, secondary storage. And then the, the management of the farm. So what that uh, animation just showed was, um, let's say you're an end user and you said that I have my special template. It's a, uh, let's say a, a Windows template which you have customized. What you do is you, you upload it to a file share and then you tell CloudStack about it. Um, CloudStack management server will download it uh, through a service VM and install it on secondary storage. And when it's ready, it'll tell you it's ready. And then once it's ready and you want to run a VM with it, uh, what CloudStack does is that it takes the, uh, the template or image from secondary storage, uh, copies it to primary storage, and then boots a VM off of it. And then primary storage actually can also be you know, local storage of the host. So, you know, fairly standard way of uh, doing it in the IIS clouds. And uh, you can even import ISOs. So very useful for installing Windows if you don't have license to begin with. So uh, just reiterating, so uh, end user request an instance. Um, we uh, we have something called a deployment planner which can be customized. So we pick a host to run the VM on. We tell the host that okay, we need to configure the network for that. VM, we copy the instance template from the secondary storage to primary storage. And if that template is already there on that particular primary storage, of course, we don't do the, bother to do the copy. Um, create the uh, data volume on the primary storage. And creating the data volume on the primary storage is usually a clone operation, right? So you can do uh, fast cloning or thin, uh, thin provisioning. Create the instance on the host, uh, plug the volume into the uh, VM, and then start the instance. Any questions about the uh, VM start process? OK. Um, so I'm just going to go into a little bit of uh, how each hypervisor works. There's some differences, obviously, because each hypervisor has its own special way of doing things. If you look at Zen Server, uh, there is no central uh, master for Zen Server. The, you install them in a pool, and then they, they elect a pool master. And then the pool master uh, coordinates all the actions of the entire uh, Zen Server cluster. And so when CloudStack talks to the, the Zen Server pool master, it's using uh, the, the, the native API, which is called uh, Zappy to talk to the Zen Server Pool Master. Um, and any operations to, let's say a VM is running here, typically, uh, if you want to stop that VM, CloudStack Manager talks to the Zen Server Pool Master host, which then tells this uh, slave uh, Zen Server to stop the VM. Um, It's talk, uh, this slide is talking about system VMs, and I'll come back to system VMs uh, later on. Um, the Zen server has um, a, a, a soft switch built into each of the hosts, uh, but the, the management tends to be at, there's no uh, distributed vSwitch available in, in Zen server. So um, if you started up a VM here and here, uh, you would have to go in and configure each switch individually, and that's what CloudStack knows to do and does. 
Oops. Can I work with you? Yeah. Sure. Sorry. So <clears throat> right now, uh, the native uh, virtual switch uh, doesn't allow you to disable DHCP uh, in favor of other tools that can automate DNS and other information. Um, so right now you're tied into the virtual switch. Is this going to be fixed in, in a release relatively soon? I'm not sure I understood that question. Alex? Yeah, I think it's fixed in 3.0. Uh, where you can actually turn off the DHCP service on on the on the Dalmar. Uh, we confirm with architecture that the switch to turn it off doesn't work. Okay, uh, we have a bug open with them, uh, but uh, no, I think he's talking about a Zen server bug. No, no, this That's is the no, you're talking about the virtual router. Virtual router, yeah. okay. Uh, unable to turn off the DHCP service. Yes, because yeah. we want to provide <laughs> DHCP out of uh, an Active Directory yeah, yeah. server that can push DNS dynamically. Right. Uh, yeah. Then then it's about that we we, we should fix. I, I don't know the, the timeline for fixing it yet. Um, any, uh, anybody use Oracle VM here? Oh, there, excellent. Um, so with, with Oracle VM, um, there is no uh, Oracle VM manager we integrate with. We run a... Uh, a cloud stack agent on each uh, OVM host, and then the cloud stack manager talks to the OVS agent through a uh, custom protocol. It's just uh, JSON underneath. But if you wanted to start a VM, there's the start VM JSON command which goes to this OVS agent and then starts up the VM. Uh -huh. And then uh, the, the limitation with uh, OVM is that you know all templates must be from Oracle, and then the shared storage that we use is OCFS2. Uh, and it says that it requires a helper cluster. Oh, that's because uh, we haven't figured out how to run the system VM on on, on OVM. Um, KVM also uh, widely popular. Lots of public clouds. Uh, with cloud stack deployed with KVM. Um, once again, we don't use the uh, um, the remoting for uh, libword. We use a, an agent install on the host, which then talks uh, locally to libword to manage the uh, the VMs. Um, just like in Zen Server, uh, network management is done on the individual bridge basis. And then there's support for Ubuntu 10.04 and RHEL 6. Anybody using different versions of KVM? Yeah. No. Any questions on KVM? I know it tends to be a quite popular in our open source in the open source community, or people try it out on KVM first. I know that um, with libvirt, I couldn't find a way to remotely push uh, a template, for instance, to upload a template. Uh, is that a capability part of the cloud aid, the, the agent that you provide? When you say push a template, uh, push it to secondary storage? As in import a template into the, into the cloud. So if you already have something that is, you know, let's say an OVA right. file or an XVA file, and you want to import it. Yeah, that's a cloud stack enhancement to that, yeah. Right. Is that the case? Yeah, it is. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, th these are these tend to be very strictly uh, VM level operations. I think even for snapshot we talk directly to Kimu or, or use uh, the Kimu utilities to do snapshots there. Um, for uh, VMware vSphere, uh, because vCenter allows you a, a lot of fantastic tools like migration, DRS, fault tolerance, uh, we talk to vCenter. Don't try to bypass it. Uh, and there's a, uh, there's a native uh, HTTP API to vCenter that we talk to. Um, 
uh, there is a uh, some special things we need to do to uh, do Amazon style snapshots on VMware what happens is that when you ask VMware to snapshot a VM it snapshots the VM it doesn't we, you can't tell it to snapshot a volume so if it has six volumes attached it, it snapshots six volumes so we need to do something special to take care of that so that you get the Amazon semantics of snapshotting individual volumes um, I think in uh, in 3.0 the uh, we use uh, the V switch to uh, to control networking. Uh, shortly, I think we're contributing control of um, Nexus 1000V as the V switch for uh, for V center or sort of for V sphere. Is that the distributed V switch or the standalone? Um, or host vSwitch? It's the Cisco replacement for the DVD. No, no, not the 1000, what's already in here? Oh, that's the standard vSwitch. Standard vSwitch. Yeah. So here's a summary of what works and what doesn't. Um, you can see that uh, support for Oracle VM, there's no uh, snapshots and no storage over provisioning. The other ones are pretty well supported. Uh, we use the native um, file format for each operating for each hypervisor. Zen Server likes VHD, vCenter, or VMware look, likes VMDK, and QCOV2 for uh, KVM. You can also actually use RAW for KVM. Um, those are the supported uh, primary storages. And I think people also ask about uh, memory over permit, and that's something we have never done, but should be easy to do. Anybody interested in memory over permit at all? Or? Yeah. What about CPU over permit? Yeah, yeah. Th that you can tune a little bit in CloudStack. Anybody have any uh, opinions on what densities they're going to run on their clouds? What densities you guys are looking for? Yeah, sure. Um, so for us, we did a lot of math around this. Um, and if you're on the Intel 5000 series processor, your density is limited by the bus to the memory ratio. So want to watch out for that. But in the E7 line, that bus is actually universally shared across the sockets and the cores. So you're not limited by density to memory core ratio. Um, so what we've looked at is uh, right now our, our production, our main environment, is running on E7s and we're actually looking at uh, running for starts on two vCPUs uh, with four gigs of memory with a 15% overcommit on CPU and memory um, at a density of about 64 VMs per node. <clears throat> and really what we're looking at is to get, uh, to use these systems for seeding for, um, you know, high density. But what we're really looking to do is to go to blades, to go to a smaller uh, uh, form factor, less uh, VM, same configuration, and then use larger systems like the uh, Dell R810, which is one terabyte of memory, uh, local six terabytes of disk uh, with multiple 10 gig links, um, with uh, four cores, 64, or sorry, four uh, sockets, 64 cores, and then building bigger VMs and separating our offerings based off of hardware and cluster groups. Um, and so the math is fairly easy. Uh, if you guys want to uh, chat, I, I can explain how it works out. On the uh, 810, are you doing one cluster per server then? One cluster. Or how, how many how many nodes, how many 810s do you, are you putting in a cluster? Uh, so based off of the provisioning need, well, for us, we have, we've separated our uh, our data center or our tenants into two spaces, a compliance space where we're running PII, PCI, and audit compliance, which has a lot of automation around visibility of logging and artifacts, uh, plus explicit in-out access roles. Um, and general, uh, what we're using is we're tagging the native VLAN, and we're dynamically shifting clusters using Cobbler on the management interface to build Zen server, and then adding it into clusters as needed, and kind of jumping the, the fence, so to speak, so that clusters are then just commodity in the space. 
Um, Cloud Strike, uh, you know, originally came from a uh, uh, public cloud uh, mentality, and one of the things we built was um, a hierarchical uh, administrative structure. So you have the root admin, and then which you know installs Cloud Strike and configures it to start with, and then uh, you have domains, and domains is like a, a unit of isolation that. You know, typically it's like a reseller if you're a public cloud, or if it's a, an organizational unit, like you know, developers QA, um, and then not terribly interesting to a lot of people, but you can also have uh, you know unlimited subdomains, and then your accounts belong to one of these domains or subdomains. And then each account can provision multiple users. And so you as an account, you can create 50 VMs, have 10 users, and all your 10 users would have access to those 50 VMs. And then at the at the account level, you can impose uh, resource limits. Typically, you know how many VMs can you run, how many snapshots can you take, how many IPs can you know, public IPs can you allocate. Um, I think I think the next topic is networking. Any questions so far about? Uh, Hypervisors or storage or accounts. So the uh, Hearn has come up with an answer for well, how how far behind is uh, Cloud Stack from Zen Server, and the intention is to be uh, one to three months behind Zen Server. But as I said, the, we are moving some of our test cases into uh, Zen Server automated test cases, just so that uh, to make sure they don't break anything. Sorry, I'm noisy. So uh, I think we had talked with Shang and, and everybody about managing the Citrix licensing out of the clusters themselves rather than going into the interfaces individually licensing. Uh, licensing. And there was talk about bundling uh, the license inside a cloud stack. Is that going to be a path that we can expect in the near future, or are we still going to manage outside of cloud stack for visibility into uh, the licensing portion? Shang, you want to answer that? I'm not aware of any plan to address that problem in the in the immediate future, right? But uh, it seems like you know if you if you have these uh, deployments at very large scale, uh, we, we should consider uh, uh, you know taking care of hypervisor upgrade and licensing eventually in, in cloud stack as well. Uh, this is another view of the uh, data center which I showed before, um, just showing how users come in and how the uh, admin comes in, uh, the pods and the secondary storage. Um, so I'm just setting this up so that you get an idea of well, where do the networking pieces fit in. Uh, oh no, that's in the other slide deck. Okay. Um, I guess a lot of you guys have used Amazon, and so you're familiar with the uh, kind of isolation that Amazon gives you. So in Amazon, you start up 20 VMs. Uh, your 20 VMs are not in the same subnet, right? You get different IPs. 
And what you use is something called uh, security groups to make sure that each VM can talk to each other. And so that is supported uh, out of the box in in uh, in Cloud Stack, and that's something called Basic Zone. And you guys may be wondering why is it called a Basic Zone? Um, I think the, it's just a historic reason. Uh, traditionally, uh, with this mode of networking, we didn't support a lot of services. And this mode of networking is a little bit easier to get up and running because you don't have to talk to your uh, network admin to provision VLANs or you know, beg them to uh, add uh, you know, trunk VLANs into the core switch. Uh, the, uh, the attraction of uh, Amazon-style networking is it's practically infinite scale. I mean, you're limited by your class C IP addresses, not by your 4,000 VLANs. So what you do is uh, you as an end user, you come in and you create some VMs. Let's say you create uh, web VMs and they land up on different hosts, on different pods even. Then you start up some database VMs and more web VMs. Um, and then you can see that they're not in the same uh, IP range because uh, each, let's say this is each, each of them is a L3 subnet. And so your VMs are not in the same range. So then how do your web VMs then talk to your database VMs? Um, what we do is we, we coordinate the hypervisor, the, the host-based, so the hypervisor-based firewall. That's the, uh, the brick wall you see there. And let you create security groups. And so we have firewall rules in here which say that you know those database VMs can access each other. And then you as an end user, you can come in and say that the web VMs can access the database VMs security group on port TCP port uh, 3306. And then everything else is dropped. We also do uh, stuff at the firewall, like because you're sharing the, this host with other tenants, we also do uh, you know, broadcast suppression, multicast suppression, anti-spoofing, um, so that you have a true multi-tenant uh, experience. Any question on uh, L3 networking? It's also called basic zone in case you guys have heard of that term. So uh, we don't expect any VLANs in the, uh, in, the in the course, which in this case. So just as you know, this, this scales, you know, run uh, tens of thousands of hosts on this kind of infrastructure. Um, it's trying to show the same thing here. Um, it's showing, I think, eight, uh, let's see, you got uh, VMs in two parts. <coughs> we got uh, different uh, guests, red guests and blue guests. Um, they're all getting IPs in the same subnet range. And so you could think that they will attack each other. But then we have the anti-spoofing rules and the uh, broadcast and multicast suppression, which prevents that. And then uh, we have uh, also rules which let the, these guests access the other blue guests in there. And then with uh, 3.0, we have a, a support for load balancers and uh, elastic IPs. So you hang off a uh, load balancer here, the next killer load balancer. And then you can offer load balancing to these guests, uh, fully automated, and also uh, elastic IP service. Anybody running a public cloud here? Um, I'm guessing this is more uh, popular with uh, web scale workloads. You know, people are moving workloads off of Amazon or um, 
people running really, really, really large data centers. Um, the other mode of networking is called advanced zone. And uh, that just virtualizes your physical network with VLANs. Um, here's an example of how that might work. You have uh, these pods here. And then I'm showing a uh, green tenant and the, and the orange tenant. We start up a, a virtual router for, the, uh, for each tenant. He gets an IP on the public net, which he can access the internet. And he gets um, an IP on the uh, on the on the on the uh, what we call the guest network as well. And so, when the VM wants to talk to the internet, he uses the virtual router as the gateway. And then, because the VLANs are stretched across the data center, uh, the orange VMs can be in any part and still access the virtual router or each other. Is that clear or not clear? Go ahead. Um, so in a private network scenario, this actually ends up, uh, most private networks not out. Uh, they don't want to actually put public IP addresses on servers. Sure. And so what we've discovered is that we're actually double allocating IP space because we're not going to put a public IP on the system. Is this something that uh, could potentially be removed? I, I believe we've discussed it with other teams. Uh, but, however, uh, well, from, for the most part, private clouds are going to want to uh, issue a single IP address and potentially not use the virtual router as the default gateway, but control it via a physical, routed, uh, physical router switch itself. Um, and this is causing a, a bit of chaos because if you are, um, you know, constrained to a certain subnet allocation, then you're basically doubling up or even tripling up based off the, the routing mechanism that you're using. Yeah, uh, I mean, this can... I mean, we, you know that we support, like, this can be a Juniper SRX, right? It doesn't have to be the virtual router. And, uh, and, and we're looking for, you know, contributions from other networking vendors so that CloudStack can control uh, other devices. Would that solve your problem or no? Okay, go ahead. So uh, what I'm asking is, in basic networking, you use a virtual router uh, to get out. Uh, in advanced networking, um, you can actually use your default gateway sure. and your physical routed infrastructure. Uh, what I'm talking more about is in that routed space, you've got in, in your design uh, a router for the public network uh, outbound uh, and then another uh, route for your default inbound mm -hmm. and ends up that you have two IP addresses uh, on your host. In a uh, public cloud, this would make sense if you wanted a public IP address for every host. In a private cloud, this doesn't make sense because you're not going to expose your internal systems uh, out to the internet using a public IP address. You're going to use a NAT on a firewall that's mm. more traditional for the data center. So what happens is you actually end up issuing two RFC 1918 IP addresses uh, to the host, and you're not using your public route anyway, but somehow it's still in there and it's causing confusion on where you're least uh, least cost route goes for traffic basically hmm. it's kind of a bit more complicated than that okay yeah let's discuss that later on i'm i'm interested in seeing why why that is um, but we do have a concept of network offering so you can remove like the source net service you can remove you know any service you want don't want uh, <coughs> Yeah, this is just one way of uh, working with advanced networking. Uh, in this mode, uh, the router provides, you know, L2 through L7 services, DHCP, uh, DNS, uh, what else? Um, uh, gateway service, uh, NAT, source NAT, firewall, port forwarding, uh, load balancing, and VPN. Sure, go ahead. Uh, in this mode, uh, because the, the VLAN stretches across the data center, if this guy sends out a multicast, it should uh, go to all the other VMs. But are you talking about like multicast routing? Uh, no, not today. Uh, what would be the use case for that?
not a clustering VLAN. But that's within the VLAN, right? Yeah. yeah. No, he's talking about routing outside the VLAN. Okay, sure. Yeah, that would be supported, yeah. But in this, uh, in the L3 case, uh, that would not be supported. Um, and I think I just want to clarify something that Pete said. Uh, when you, when this uh, web VM talks to the internet, um, it's through the core switch. There's no virtual router involved. There's, it can either go through, go through the load balancer or the L3 core switch. Uh, there's no uh, virtual machine involved there to intercept the traffic. It does go through the host-based firewall. Though. Um, and another thing uh, we did uh, as a as a tech preview in uh, in the upcoming releases, you can configure these uh, connectivity for your uh, tenants using uh, software-defined networks using overlays, and that's uh, coming out as a tech preview in the next release. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So. Uh, the limitation here, obviously, is you have 4,000 <coughs> VLANs. Uh, VLAN is, is 12 bits, so typically uh, 4,000 VLANs. Uh, what happens is that sometimes your switch actually falls over even before you can provision 4,000 VLANs. And so if you use a um, software-defined networking, which just uses overlays, then you can go well beyond 4,000. And, uh, and the scalability problem then becomes something like the L3 scalability problem, where you're controlling thousands and thousands of uh, virtual switches from the Cloud Stack Management Server, uh, as opposed to controlling thousands and thousands of uh, hypervisor-based firewalls. So it's moving the scalability problem a different way. Question: Does Cloud Stack support uh, have anything like an open flow controller that is inside the manager? Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. Uh, we have a built-in open flow it's a controller. It's, it doesn't talk open floor today to the uh, to the V switches, uh, but it can. Um, just because I think the the, the protocol that support the V switch doesn't let let it set up tunnels today. Uh, so we use the hypervised API to do that. Uh, but uh, you can using the network uh, plugin architecture, you can talk to any uh, third party. Open flow controller you want. And one more, there are a couple of different kinds of tunnels. There is STT, there's WXLAN, and so on. So, what is supported with CloudStack? That really depends on the <coughs> hypervisor. Uh, so, uh, what we did for uh, the, the upcoming release is works on Zen Server 6, and that supports, uh, that has OVS, Open vSwitch, built into it. And the release of Open vSwitch it has supports only GRE. Uh, it doesn't support the external or SDT. Uh, go ahead. Hello. Yeah. My name is Thomas. Uh, I had a question about uh, will it be possible to edge more than one IP address to a one virtual machine uh, without using advanced network? Because uh, don't want to use NAT. Don't want to use NAT. A lot of customers use uh, more uh, public IPs on the same VM, and I don't want to have NAT between them. I, Alex, can you correct me? I believe it's supported. I saw the code to support it. Um, But it is a popular request, yeah, because uh, if you look at traditional uh, VPSs uh, where people run multiple uh, websites with different SSL certificates, they want different IPs for that, yeah. Yeah, I have to look back, yeah. back to our stuff too. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. I'll get back to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here's an uh, what it 
looks like as a virtual network. <clears throat> Again, we got the blue VMs on the uh, on the red tenant. Uh, everybody gets their own uh, virtual router VM, and that virtual router VM is doing things like NAT, DHCP load balancing, and VPN. Now, the VPN I'm talking about here is just a remote access VPN. You got your Windows, Mac, or iPhone. And you want to connect back into uh, your network. Uh, you can use uh, remote access VPN to do that. And uh, you can see that because of the VLAN isolation, they get the same um, IP space if needed. Uh, actually, when you create your network, you can ask for any seeder you want. What's not here is IPv6, as you can see. Here's uh, some variations on this uh, layer two uh, guest networking. Um, here we have the uh, cloud stack built in virtual router providing you uh, load balancing, NAT, etc. Or you can do uh, physical devices. You can say, I wanted a Juniper SRX and a NetScaler load balancer. And then uh, once you install this using the admin uh, UI or admin API, uh, we treat it as a multi-tenant device, and then we uh, configure rules on the uh, SRX or the uh, NetScaler to give you the same service with the same API that you get with the virtual router. And then there's variations here where you can say that I want the load balancer behind the firewall as well, but it's side by side versus in line one. Uh, we also support uh, the F5 a load balancer, and then you can see here for IP address management and DNS, it's still running the virtual router, but all it does is provide your DHCP and DNS. And uh, if you do uh, the layer three uh, type of isolation, uh, either you can run it on the public where every guest VM gets a uh, actual public IP address, uh, or actually this is wrong, uh, or you could uh, front end behind the next scalar load balancer, give it private IP addresses, and then allocate public IP addresses on the next scalar load balancer. Uh, sorry about that. These should be RFC 1918 addresses. And then the, the virtual router is running in each part just to give you a DHCP and DNS. A oh, question there, sorry. Hello? Yeah. So this external load balancer is supported only in advanced zone networking or even in basic? Uh, this one here? The, you have the NetScaler load balancer. Yeah, the, this NetScaler is supported in both. Uh, the F5 is not supported in both. F5 will be supported only in uh, advanced, but it should so, be easy to put. So any vendor can write plugins for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all everything's written as plugins, right? So any any vendor can come and write their own plugin. <coughs> so what happens is that when the API request comes in, we have this well-defined set of callouts into the plugin, and as long as your plugin respects those or understands and implements those uh, callouts, uh, you can orchestrate anything there. You know, third-party SDN controllers, Cisco devices, or whatever you want to do, you can do it. It's just a matter of writing the code and testing. Hello, is this a CS virtual router sitting on management server, or it's a, it's a different host machine? It's running in the same physical infrastructure that your rest of your VMs are on. Yeah, so because the management server can be in, in a different zone entirely. Right. So let me show you this here. So you can see that the virtual router here is running inside a hypervisor in the, in the cluster, which supports the rest of the VMs. So one of the, uh, you could say, guiding goals or design principles of CloudStack is that the management server is not in the data path any, at any point in time. It's 
if we need to be in the data path, we orchestrate uh, service VMs uh, to do that or physical devices to do that. And if you did something like this, you know, your, your vendor would provide you, you know, HA. So if you wanted a firewall to be HA, they have a native HA for SRX. NetScaler has HA for, uh, for itself. And they would just use that and touch that code and care whether you used HA or not. Go ahead. I had a question on, right now we are seeing most of these are having two, two networks. That's one is public and one is uh, for the internal one. Uh, is Sometimes there is a storage network that's completely separate. Uh, it uh, can that be plugged in in this architecture? Uh, storage network. network into the VM. Yeah. <coughs> no. What we do is. Uh, well. No. Yeah. Into the VM. Yes. A storage network into the VM. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, if you look at. Uh, what we what we let you do is uh, you know typically there's two other networks here one is a control network to talk to the hypervisor and then there's a storage network and so we let you tell us what storage network is the hypervisor is connected to and when the VM is uh, when the hypervisor provisions or talks to the storage it talks to the other storage network um, but the VM never has direct access to uh, the storage network. Well, so the, there's actually the, the, there's the network of um, providing the block device to the VM, and then the uh, VM may actually want to have direct access to the storage server through a specific network. And for that, you can actually have the administrator provide a shared a shared network that is owned only by that particular account, um, and that network can be plugged directly into the VM and and as long as the storage server is accessible through that network, the VM can access that. Uh, but it's an administrator um, functionality only. But uh, uh, so that means that there is, a, so when the VM moves, right, this network is now, you know, dangling. Somehow it has to get those IPs back into the uh, space there. So there seems to be a third network that should be there where when a VM moves from one to the other to get you know, two networks might be configured, but the third one from the storage that comes in, there has to be some provision through which it has to be attached. When when you say uh, when the VM moves, do you mean VM migration? Yeah, so let's say a hypervisor is not, you know, went down and then the VM moves to another hypervisor. If the, it is not in the cloud stack space, then that third net, uh, network won't be configured. On the oh, no, no. Uh, in, in this case, it is in the cloud stack space. So okay. in cloud stack, you can have the administrator. It's a huge echo with this thing. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is. So uh, what you can do is the administrator can say, hey, I, I want to create a network uh, for this account only. Uh, it's on a specific VLAN. And, and then when the VM is launched, it, um, the end user will pick and says, oh, here's the default network. And here, I also want to be participating on this particular shared network. Uh, and when the VM is launched, it will actually come up with two NICs. One NIC is on, on, on the default network for get going out on the internet and things like that. And then the, and then another NIC would be on this uh, storage network. Uh, and when the VM moves, then actually the NICs move with it. There will be gratuitous, gratuitous uh, ops to make sure the IP is moved uh, uh, so that it doesn't lose the, those IPs. I think uh, when we come to the networking deep dive uh, later in the afternoon, we'll discuss that. Or we'll show, we'll, I'll actually draw it out and show you how it's done. Uh, it's getting to be 11 o'clock. Um, uh, I got Alex coming up and doing a little more deep dive on architecture uh, later on, but let me just quickly go through this. Um, so you saw that you know you could do any number of uh, different combinations here. And the way you do this is uh, you do something called a network offering. And so you go to the admin UI, and then you, you design a network offering saying that uh, I want a virtual router or a net scaler or F5, whatever, uh, to support this uh, 
had a network, and then when you actually, when the end user creates a network, he has a catalog of network offerings which he chooses. And if he chooses one that has a net scaler providing load balancer, then he automatically gets a net scaler. And then if he's happy with the virtual router to begin with, and then later on says, you know, I've got lots of traffic, he can uh, shut down his, uh, his network, and then upgrade his virtual uh, network to uh, the, the next offering, and then start up his VMs, and they should be up and going. Although I don't think you need to shut down your VMs. I think you just need to start the, I don't know. You do have to sh shut down the VMs, yeah. For upgrading from network offerings, yeah. It, it kind of depends. Um, uh, when we're, for NetScaler and F5, I, the multi-tenancy is implemented by um, IP address uh, domains versus VLAN domains. And so, so even though you have multiple VLANs going into them, your IP addresses have to be a segmented. Uh, for the VR, we don't. Um, so then uh, when, we, when we upgrade from VR to NetScaler, then we do have to shut down the VMs to reprogram the IP addresses so that the VMs can, can right. actually be participating. Hello. The uh, virtual router is only needed in advanced uh, networking mode, right? Not uh, used in the uh, basic mode, right? Uh, in basic zone, what it does is uh, it provides you DHCP and DNS. Okay. So it can be used in both modes. Yeah, it's you pretty much have to use it because you, you want you want the guest VM to get an IP, so you need to run DHCP somewhere, and uh, and so that's why you run it in each uh, in, in in basic zone as well. Uh, I think it also provides the user data. Yeah. yeah, so if you're uh, familiar with Amazon's uh, user data and metadata, uh, then the virtual router would provide that facility for you too. Uh, I was using the metadata here, but there was one metadata which was not publishing correctly, not sure, but that was the public host name that was still showing the one which was provisioned through the through the cloud stack. So uh, is the... Uh, you, so that uh, public host name is the one which has to be one which is the, uh, registered in the DNS, right? Sure. I'm sure that's a bug that can be fixed. Okay. All right. Yes. <coughs> I mean, uh, I mean, just to clarify, these virtual routers are started up automatically. I mean, you don't have to do anything, lift a finger to do it. The first time a VM starts in this pod, the virtual router starts up automatically. And then if it dies, we restart it. So it's all automatic, fully, you know, autonomic, if you can use that word. And same thing with uh, this as well. If this virtual router, you can actually deploy two in a, a redundant mode uh, using VRRP. And then, or if you're happy with, uh, you know, failover times in, in tens of seconds, you can just deploy one of them. If we detect that this one died, we will restart one more and reprovision the state. You know, you lose some connections, obviously, but the, the static configuration will recreate it. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, how is the VLAN space ma managed between the, your physical network, let's say your physical router and a virtual router? Uh, so the virtual router doesn't actually see any VLANs uh, because the hypervisor removes the tag and, and gives the, the network to the, to the VMs. So the virtual router is just like any other v VM. Okay. So all the tenant uh, VMs, including the uh, virtual router, they are going to sit on one particular VM. Exactly. Uh, one more question related sure. to virtual router. Is this virtual router, say, transparent uh, to user, or user has to specify the virtual router in the deployment? Yeah, so when he, uh, let me go back to user experience. All the way back. Uh, 
Again. So, oh boy. Okay. Yeah, so <coughs> when you do a uh, deploy VM, so you have selected your template, you have selected your service offering, you have selected your you know, disk offering, um, and now you select the network you want to deploy the VM in. Right? And if you're not happy with any of these networks, you can add a new network. I mean, when the, and the new network wizard will say, well, which network offering do you want? If the network offering says that all these services are provided by virtual router, then you get a virtual router. So for, for Cloud Stack, it's actually very important for us that we hide all the physical underlines and only expose virtual concepts to the to the end user, right? So to the end user, what they are getting are networks, network rules, things like that. And then, then CloudStack is the one that maps to, to underneath. So they understand they have a network, and when, they, when they're inside the VM, they see they have IP address and can go out, but they do not understand that, oh, it was implemented by VLAN 40 or 45, things like that. A question on... Um just on the networking side, uh, if you had to look at, say, there is say some congestion in the network, and you've got some VMs which are going to be like which require some additional quality of service, and you want to specify, say, a dot one p bit or anything like that that is specific for uh, to give like a higher class of service for that. Is that possible with the virtual router or with any of the other switching or networking infrastructure that you have? Um, when you design a network offering. You can actually specify, uh, I think, the maximum rate, uh, but that's typically enforced by the hypervisor. Um, at the virtual router, we don't try to enforce anything. Virtual router tends to be connected to the public internet slow enough, okay. it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Go ahead. You made a comment about. <coughs> IPv6 earlier. Uh, yeah. Can you repeat that? And so this has been really focused on IPv4 address allocation and conservation uh, in the world of IPv6. Hopefully, a everything just works, and b you know you don't have those problems. Uh, IPv6 is a very uh, confusing world. It's about 200 RFCs, you know, trying to do the exact same thing. Uh, one RFC saying the other is bad and pointing at each other. Um, I don't think that the networking community has arrived at IPv6 best practices. You know, what's NAC? Is it 4 to 6 or 6 to 4 or tunneling or what do you want to do? Uh, what we can easily support is uh, if you do not have the virtual router, um, then we could just allocate uh, IPv6 here, public IPv6 here directly. Uh, that's very easy to do. It's, it is when you want to do, um, and the other thing that's easy to do is IPv6 addresses for your load balancer. It's the question of what do you want to do if there is any routing involved? Um, is it, do you do BGP on that, or do you do you know, OSPF? Or how do you exchange these routes and so on and so forth? So, and we haven't, uh, I don't think anybody is, I have certainly ex welcome input from the community on how to uh, do stuff like firewalling on IPv6 and uh, all those services on IPv6. Well, this is not supported today. In not supported today. Yeah, but the but the, but the primary confusion comes in um, when you want to do. You got your own. Um, IPv6 public space here, how does the rest of the internet know to come in here to do, do like, uh, do they bring their own IPs, do they do subnetting, um, and then there's well-known attacks using IPv6 and ARP, which have not been solved by a lot of vendors yet. So. That, that is on a roadmap though, yes? Yeah. Who's that? Sorry. Here. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Is that coming later? I think it's said in the fall is on your roadmap? Or? Yeah.
Okay. Um, are you thinking about using DHCP for IPv6 or the router announcements? Uh, it's probably going to be DHCP. Okay. Um, uh, Windows as well support DHCP. I know that uh, the later Linuxes also support DHCP. Uh, the base case needs to be uh, router ad advertisements, but advertisements indeed. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, DHCP v6 is increasingly supported. Yeah. Okay. Because it, yeah, it's it just you get more control with uh, DHCP v6. No, but it is most of the Linux distributions, and uh, they don't support DHCP v6 out of the box. So you have to go into the instance, enable it before it works. Oh, is that right? Okay. I, I was under the impression that it just works with the 6.0 and the 11.04. Okay. So as, as I said, you know, IPv6 is uh, a lot of people will want it, but in practice, it's not there yet, at least in North America. I'm sure the Japanese have different opinions. Um, so we have a bunch of system VMs to optimize the uh, the data path for CloudStack. Um, generally, they're stateless, so the die we recreate them, um, and then we if there's any state that's associated like firewall rules or load balancing rules, we just reprovision them from the database. And then these VMs are special because they have access to the control plane, and they can talk to the management server. Uh, usually they have three interfaces, you know, one to the public because they're providing a public service, uh, one guest so that they can talk to other VMs, and a control plane so that they can talk to the hypervisor or to the management server. Uh, one example is the uh, console proxy VM. It gives you an AJAX style uh, HTTP uh, console viewer, HTTPS, sorry. Um, what it does is grabs the VNC output from the hypervisor and then uh, allows you to view it on the browser. Um, and then as, as you get more and more uh, demands for consoles from your end users, we automatically spin up uh, extra console for our CVMs to do this. And what's, what's happening is that there's a Java-based server sitting inside that VM, which is uh, performing the functions for you. A uh, similar story on the secondary storage VM. So it's it's how the management server can talk to uh, different NFS servers across different zones. Um, so it, it, if you want to download templates, manage your snapshots, this is what the secondary storage VM does for you. Uh, somebody asked about copying between zones, so we let you do that using this uh, particular VM. Um, and then if you add multiple mounts, then we will just spawn multiple uh, secondary storage VMs for you. And last but not least, uh, virtual router VMs uh, provides all these wonderful services. So you can do redundancy. And uh, typically, the management server configures the virtual router or SSH. And if it's a Zen server or KVM, it'll talk uh, proxy through the hypervisor. What it does is it sends a plugin command to, uh, to the hypervisor, and then the hypervisor sends an SSH command to the, the virtual router. Uh, just some information on what it is today. It's uh, Debian 6 squeeze, and then uh, it tends to get revved every uh, cloud stack release. Um, it's 32 bits. And what uh, we have uh, offerings for the virtual router too. So you can ask for small or big virtual router. So you can say, I want one core or two cores or four cores. And uh, we found that, you know, for maximum performance, you typically want two cores and four gigabytes of RAM. Um, we only install essential software packages because it is like a security uh, access point for for the end users. Um, so just some best practices on security and performance. Um, let's try to get the latest versions and keep it patched to the latest security updates. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, in our recent deployment, we found a number of problems finding documentation on your network workflows, what ports you're listening on, where's the source origin destination, which made it exceptionally difficult mm -hmm. to actually build a proper security scheme from an ACL perspective outside of CloudStack. 
Um, is there any documentation or is there any future effort coming to document the workflow of ports uh, that are going to be used? Um, Alex, could you take down that note for <laughs> me? Uh, certainly a valid question. I have seen uh, a PowerPoint from somebody where every port listed, and I can see if I can dig that up. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that on the docs. It wasn't accurate with 3.0. We basically turned on our firewalls and looked at deny routes on multiple destinations. Uh, VNC, for instance, listens on a large port pool, hmm. but then does a translation in AJAX from an HTTPS connection to a VNC connection, and then reroutes you from your host directly to the VNC port on the Zen server, not necessarily the VM on the Zen server. Right. As an example, of something that wasn't very clearly documented. No, it's certainly a very good concern, yeah, we should document that. Um, uh, some more uh, uh, details about the system VM. So, because we use SSH to SSH into the system VM, when you install the uh, Cloud Stack Management Server, we generate new keys and we can randomize the system VM password as well. Um, and then, if we have any uh, patches to, because there's scripts and processes inside the uh, system VM which can change or there's bugs in them, uh, you can actually uh, patch them by. Uh, just restarting them. Um, they just check if there's a, they mount a special ISO, they check if the ISO has changed, if so it patches and then reboots. Uh, so again, highly automated, uh, a lot of this happens behind your back. And then the same system VM works on uh, Zen Server, KVM, VMware so that you can do a multi-hypervisor cloud. And uh, you know, it's, it's a fairly well-defined way of orchestrating your system VM, so if you wanted to do something special to yourself, you want to monitor something, you want to do some other specialized task inside the cloud on behalf of the management server, it's there and you can use it. Are all of these um, completely stateless? It could be run out of a Pixie boot environment as opposed to uh, stateful on disk installed? Uh, today, uh, I know somebody did a Pixie boot uh, implementation for Cloud Stack, but what is supported today is just template based, so we can't do big Go ahead. Yeah, this uh, this is a question for if a pod has heterogeneous uh, hypervisor, so probably KVM and uh, uh, VMware. Uh, so, what are the priority rules on this for the system VMs? Where would they go in a heterogeneous uh, pod? Yeah, uh, right now it's random. Okay, but uh, you know, feel free to raise an enhancement. Go ahead. So you have a uh, you have this as a Debian based system, and previously it was something other than Debian. How modular is it if we want to change the underlying operating system, or how modular could it be made? It could definitely be made more modular. Uh, the, there's a script which builds the system VM, and so you just run you know build system VM dot shell, and it just goes out to the APT repositories and builds it. So in that way, it is fairly uh, easy to replicate on, on different operating systems because the list of packages is, is, is there. Um, I know some some operating systems call the same package differently. Like I think it's Apache 2 on Debian and versus HTTP on on CentOS, I think. So uh, there is one script which is the cloud early config which needs to be customized. That's the one that mounts the ISO and tries to figure out, well, what is this VM? And I think if that's fixed, I think it's easy. So I know we've had some issues around uh, kernel versions. Is there a set set of tests that would, we could apply towards, will this function as a system VM in all of the potential roles, um, that, especially as we start adding things like open vSwitch uh, type capabilities? It, does that exist today? Is there a defined or even a defined list of you must have these things or these kernel modules uh, built and enabled uh, and loaded? That, that, that's a good, good question. No, uh, there is a lot of assumptions built in about what the which router can do. Uh, I think Alex and I have discussed um, having like a capability set for and then when you uh, inst install your cloud, you say, well, what capability set does this template have? Certainly that's an improvement we can do, yes. 
Okay. I'll follow Bug for that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it'll be great if some, some other operating system comes in Fedora. Or, you know. Debian does tend to be you know, conservative in going to the latest, so that's why I like Debian. But if you guys want the latest and greatest, sure, go for it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, some of the big blocks inside the cloud stack. We got uh, the UI. Obviously, uh, you guys must have seen it. We have uh, service management, which is through APIs, billing, metering, accounts. Uh, set of image libraries, the templates we talked about. Um, we give you services like uh, backup, load balancing, you know, the entire suite of network services and monitoring. And then uh, resource management, we can pick, you know, or customize which hypervisor or which host you want to run VMs on. Um, workload management, you know, you can put hosts into maintenance, pods into maintenance. Um, a whole bunch of, of fine grain control we provide, and all over, you know, uh, this set of hypervisors on a set of physical resources. Um, ah, the octopus. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think the somewhat Pete's question is like, what happens where? Um, so you got the bunch of people coming in. Um, the UIs, uh, monitoring servers, um, people using uh, FOG or EC2 API, they're all talking the cloud stack and admin and end user API to this cluster of management servers. And between the cluster of management servers, there's a custom protocol maintaining the cluster state, you know, figuring out who's going to control what. Uh, the cluster talks to MySQL, right? And then, depending on what hypervisor cluster they're talking to, if you're talking to Oracle, they talk Zen API, vCenter, vCenter API, uh, Zen Server, Zappy. If it's KVM, we run an agent here on the uh, on each uh, host in the cluster, and we talk our uh, custom JSON protocol. If it's the Juniper SRX, for example, we'll talk NetConf, uh, Nitro API to the NetScaler. So it's all native APIs. There's no uh, attempt to reinvent the wheel here. Um, and then we have agents inside each of these uh, system VMs, and we'll talk to them using JSON or through SSH. And then the secondary storage VM will also talk HTTP to, uh, to Swift or to the file share to download and manage your templates and snapshots. Um, the secondary storage VM also mounts the NFS server, the uh, uh, the secondary storage and all the hypervisors also have access to the NFS server. Um, the console proxy VM talks VNC to all the hypervisors. It grabs the uh, console images. And then if you're an end user, you come in through the Ajax console and, uh, and view your images from the console proxy VM. Any questions on this? It's just a repetition of whatever I've been saying. Oops, here we go. Uh, so inside the cloud stack server, uh, what happens is that you got this uh, API servlet, standard Tomcat servlet. Uh, did I mention that cloud stack runs inside Tomcat? It's just a web app inside Tomcat, right? Uh, you get this API servlet. It um, wow, what happened here? Sorry, it's a mixture between uh, Mac PowerPoint and Windows PowerPoint. It's not looking format correctly. Um, it just gets you know formed into commands and queued up inside this job queue. And then there's a thread pool that just takes up uh, jobs from the job queue and calls the services API 
it's a well-defined uh, interface API here, uh, which then calls into the Cloud Stack kernel to do the exact task. You want to start a VM, you want to do create a volume, snapshot a volume, and then the kernel, uh, you know, reads from the database, writes to the database to do whatever it needs to do, and then it talks to the message bus over an agent API, and then the message bus make sure that the end resource, which is like a hypervisor or a network device, um, which, which understands the API for the net hypervisor or the network device, uh, this resource gets that command from, from the message bus and then talks to the end resource. And then we have these uh, plugins and adapters here which help customize the behavior for the kernel if it's a uh, different networking model or a different and is it basic zone, or is it advanced zone, is it um, a particular kind of storage which supports snapshots or not, um, uh, which host to deploy on, as you can customize the, the deployment planner. Um, so these are all uh, customizations which you can, which third parties can write, or there are uh, lots of them built into the uh, into cloud stack as well. And so uh, you get this uh, staged, asynchronous way uh, an API flows through the uh, system. It gets queued up in one job queue here, and then as the kernel decides what to do with it, it sends it to one or more uh, end resources to do its job through a message bus again. Any uh, questions about this? Excuse me. Uh, job queue, uh, is it just standard GMS queue? Uh, today it's just an in-memory queue, uh, standard. But it is no, 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 no. GMS it's, API. It's, no, it's not GMS API, it's, it, it's a Hong Kong version, it's backed by the database. What database? Back, uh, backed by the MySQL database underneath. Ah, okay. All right. Um, is it possible you guys would replace this with something uh, like ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ? Uh, that way you can make that bus more generic. We can use it for uh, other systems to tap into those notifications. Uh, absolutely. I think and part of the um, move to um, open source is hoping people can, can make that replacement. Uh, I think that's all my uh, slides. Uh, could you give your slides to uh, Don? I thought you might have changed yourself. Oh, we can take a break here. What do you think?